Despite our best efforts, and no matter how much money we throw at a problem, some outcomes remain beyond our control. Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are exploring Harrow's Hall and the many mansions of Harry Selfridge. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting or maybe tragic episode of This House. In 1858, Harry Selfridge was born into a rough family situation. Both of his brothers died from illness in their childhood, and when his father was discharged from the Union Army during the Civil War, he never returned home. This left Harry and his mother to fend for themselves in Jackson, Michigan. His mother became a schoolteacher and barely made enough money to keep food on the table. All throughout his childhood, Harry delivered newspapers to help his mom pay the bills. He also worked at a dry goods store owned by Leonard Fields, a senior partner at the company which would eventually be renamed to Marshall Field & Company. When Harry dropped out of school at 14, he bounced around from gigs to odd jobs, searching for a career where he could make enough money to support his mother. That's when Leonard Field decided to introduce the young, hardworking Harry to Marshall Field. The pay was good and the job was steady. Starting off as a stock boy, he worked his way up in the company over the next 25 years until he became a junior partner. Not only was Harry able to support his mother by having her move in with him, he also found love and married Rose Buckingham. Rose's life couldn't have been more opposite from Harry's as she had grown up in a wealthy household, but the two had more in common than anyone could have guessed. Her father, Benjamin Hale Buckingham, had amassed a fortune through real estate holdings and grain warehousing. But despite his success, he passed away when Rose was only four years old, leaving her to be raised by her mother. Rose had been just as ambitious as Harry. When she received her inheritance, she went against the social norms of the time to become a real estate developer, building middle-class homes in Chicagoland. She independently multiplied her fortune, and even though she worked, she was still accepted by Chicago's high society and became known for her generous philanthropy. Now that the two were married, it was time for them to start their new life together. They purchased a city mansion along Chicago's Lakeshore Drive and moved in with Harry's mother. But the money kept pouring in. Harry created his own department store to compete with Marshall Fields and instantly sold it for a massive profit. This allowed him to retire early in 1904. A few years earlier, Harry and Rose had built their country estate in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, naming it Harrow's Hall. Around this time, Lake Geneva had become an enclave for the ultra-wealthy, who sought more privacy and exclusivity away from the Great Lakes. Harry and Rose decided they wanted to live in this quiet seclusion, enjoying the fruits of their labor. Completed in 1899, Harrow's Hall had been finished out in the Tudor Revival style with rusticated stone base, ornate brickwork, and half-tempered facade. The wooded lot gave way to sweeping views of the lake, with the house resting high up on a ridge. Approaching the front of the house, we traveled down a winding path through a thickly forested patch of land before finding Harrow's Hall resting at the edge of an expansive lawn. As we pull below the carriage porch, we'll dismount our buggy and greet the family dog before we head inside. Entering Harrow's Hall, we are immediately greeted by the grand double staircase boasting elaborate gothic tracery. At its landing, a tufted sofa rounds out with the balustrade, allowing us to sit down and enjoy the intricate fretwork surrounding us. This leads our eyes upwards, where we find gothic tracery rounding out in front of metallic paint, glowing from the domed, leaded glass skylight. Had we ventured to the right after entering, we would have found the parlor overlooking Lake Geneva. And while the views are picture perfect, the gothic fireplace does its best to compete for the spotlight. Let's cut back across the stair hall, leaving the parlor to find the dining room sitting opposite from us. Above us, the plaster ceiling swirls with gothic tracery, decorated further by hand-stenciled flowering vines. The built-in sideboard extends all the way to the frieze and is flanked by murals depicting the family in an idealistic natural setting. To the far end of the dining room, we look out once again over Lake Geneva, realizing that the house has views of the water from three sides. While Harry and Rose had set out to retire and live out their happily ever after, this isn't where their story ends. They enjoyed the quiet life at Harrow's Hall for a few years, but Harry quickly grew bored of retirement. Only two years later, in 1906, he traveled to London where he was inspired to start a new department store which would be named Selfridge's Oxford Street. The department store was an immediate success and the couple decided to relocate to England. Harry and Rose rented Highcliffe Castle while they established their names in the UK and began planning a grand residence which Rose would design for them to call their own. They purchased Hengstbury Head, a unique geographical formation which juts into the English Channel, and Rose began designing a castle to be built at the end of it and surrounded by water. Unfortunately, just as construction was set to start in 1918, the Spanish flu swept through the population and Rose did not survive. Harry grieved the loss of Rose for years, but eventually he began to move on, re-entering society in 1921 by leasing Lansdowne House in London. While living there, he met the Dolly sisters, a pair of identical twins named Jenny and Rosie who had become famous entertainers. 
By 1925, Harry and the sisters had formed a love triangle and he began funding their lavish lifestyles. He reportedly gave them millions of dollars to maintain their gambling habits and showered them with expensive jewelry. But as time went on, Harry focused his attention on Jenny, paying her $10 million to marry him in 1933. Jenny agreed to his proposal, but she had been seeing Max Constant on the side, who wasn't twice her age. She went for one last rendezvous with Max, but while they were traveling through France, he crashed a sports car, leaving Jenny permanently disfigured. The accident was so horrific that her insides were completely rearranged, bones were broken, and her face had to be completely reconstructed, leading her to receive dozens of surgeries over the following years. Harry helped pay for her medical expenses, but decided to call off the wedding. All the while, he had paid no attention to his spending habits, and what little was left of his fortune was wiped out by the Great Depression. In 1947, he died alone after battling pneumonia. While his houses in the UK continued to stand, his grand country house, once known as Harrow's Hall, met the wrecking ball in 1975. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts down below in the comments section. I also want to take a moment to let you know about some exciting new additions to our merch shop. Following Mansion Madness, I created a commemorative Mark Hopkins Mansion coffee mug and threw in a few other well-known houses as well. I wish I could have gotten these out sooner, but I wanted to make sure the quality was up to my standards before selling them. Click on the merch shop below to get yours today. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time on This House.